that which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. I'm ahead of the curve, also known as James Bergman, and in this book review I will be discussing Christopher Hitchens's book Mortality, first published in 2012. Today is the 10th anniversary of Christopher Hitchens's death, and I thought I would do a video review of his book Mortality. I actually read this piece about a year ago or a year and a half ago, and what this book is, which obviously was his last, it's a collection of essays as he was dying of uh, throat cancer, um, that of the esophagus. It's a collection of essays that are based on mortality, as you may have guessed, and he also goes into philosophers such as Nietzsche and discusses uh, ideas and uh, culture and, and our view towards death. A very, very short piece. It's 106 pages, my copy, by Atlantic Books, I believe it is. I can't actually find... There we go, Atlantic Books. So it's a very short read. It took me about two hours to fully complete on my reading today. And I want to begin this video not necessarily reviewing the book, but just explaining for those who are unaware, my introduction to Christopher Hitchens and how much he has influenced me over the years. So I first noticed Hitchens, is a good way to put it, when he was referenced by Richard Dawkins um, and Sam Harris. And when I was younger, I was, let's say about 15 maybe or, or 14, I was <laughs> um, an atheist. Um, I wasn't particularly brought up on atheism. In the UK, religion really isn't taken very seriously. It's kind of a commodity, um, a banality, really. A lot of people are atheists, but they just, you know, pe people abide by this spirituality sort of label. Um, and as vague as that is, that would entail that they are somewhat, well, atheistic in the sense of towards conventional religious ideologies. And so... At this time, when I was this uh, more, uh, how do I put it, ignorant, militant atheist, I would binge watch Richard Dawkins' videos on YouTube. Uh, Richard Dawkins destroys this person. <laughs> um, yeah, I think her name was Wendy Wright, perhaps, and and she was and 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 she was uh, he did a sort of a meme of her show me the evidence show me the evidence and I love that I love that clip show me the evidence show me the evidence I was first introduced to Dawkins um, because I read his The God Delusion first well actually I think I read The Selfish Gene and then I read The God Delusion and at the time I thought it was a great book. Um, I don't, I think it's a good introductory book. I, I've discussed this before, but it's not exactly the most scholar, scholarary, scholarary, scholar, scholar, scholarary. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's not the most sophisticated attack on the philosophical arguments of religion. And neither is Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great. The New Atheism movement consisted of Hitchens, Dawkins, Dennett and Harris. And Hitchens was, yeah, he, he was nearly last of that, actually, of me um, going through the videos of atheism on YouTube. And I don't know how, actually, because I think I just underestimated him. And I, I knew more of Dawkins, I suppose. But and also Hitchens' content is, is political as well, whereas Dawkins is very much tied to science and attacking religion. So I, I wasn't fond of Hitchens at first, I suppose, because I wasn't really interested in his other work. But I, I don't know what moment it was, but I suppose I bought God Is Not Great and I read it. I really liked it. And then I watched more of his videos and then I just became completely enticed with him. And as I read more of his books, such as arguably... Um, mortality, God is not great. Um, as I read all of these books, um, I have Blaming the Victims there, which I haven't actually read yet. It's by um, Hitchens and Edward Said. Um, I also want to read Said's Orientalism. I'm going to review that soon when I check it out. Um, 
I'm just trying to remember all the other Hitchens books that I've that I've read, but they are coming to my mind at the moment. But um, I, I'm far from finishing all of them, <laughs> that's for sure. He did write over 20 books, so in a sense I am glad that I haven't read all of his works because, well, there's still more Hitch to consume, I suppose. So, regarding specifically how Christopher Hitchens' uh, influence energised me, my life, is when I read his works or when I watched his videos, I was astounded by how he spoke, how he wrote, how poetic, but also concise he often was, how comedic, how witty. He was the full package, really. He, his rhetoric is just off the charts, one of the best rhetoricans of the modern age, no doubt about it. And that isn't to say either that everything he said was completely accurate or anything. This is strictly just rhetorical skills, completely unparalleled, right? Even if he was wrong about a point, it didn't matter because he was convincing in his rhetoric. He was the most convincing guy ever to talk to. And guys like Rushdie, uh, Martin Amos, you know, his, his friends, uh, which I'm still yet to read Martin Amos's book with Hitchens referenced in it. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a autobiography. As I've alluded to there, Hitchens has influenced me the most in his writing and, and how to write in a convincing way, how to use rhetoric when you speak, um, to use uh, all sorts of mannerisms and uh, tactics when convincing people, persuading, um, arguing. At the moment anyway, he's my favourite non-fiction writer and that's simply because of his style, not necessarily what content he brought out, but actually how he wrote. It was just completely unparalleled. And so I sit here with uh, this coat referencing Hitchens, with this t-shirt referencing the Hitch, and Johnny Walker Black over there. And as you can see, he has influenced me greatly. So with how much the Hitch has influenced me personally, I want to now get to a more uh, review segment of this video. So, regardless of how sad this book is, it's written in the same unparalleled sense as his other works. It is utterly witty, it is um, heartbreaking, it is extremely intriguing, uh, all, the, all the things, all the insights that he has as he's dying, his um, descriptions of cancer, his struggles with it, it it's, it's utterly heartbreaking, but you're reading it half smiling and half crying, in a sense. But I suppose the sorrow is skin deep, because at least you knew that he, even though he burnt the candle at both ends, as he would say in the book, referencing Edna St. Malay, which I have her poetry book there. Um, I also didn't know, by the way, that, <laughs> that he was referencing, all the time that I have heard him say that, he was actually referencing that that poem by her. I read that poem book independent of my liking towards Hitchens and I was like oh my god when I drew the line together I was like wow <laughs> another another reference. This time indirectly though. So even though he burnt the candle at both ends as far as I'm concerned he made the most of his life and I would even argue I would go even so far to argue and as Hitchens would say I would even have the nerve to argue that it was worth it regardless of his illness at the end, because he lived much more than most people ever get the chance to. Not alone the opportunity, but even given the opportunity, they wouldn't live as much as he has. Um, he he really made the most of his time. He was always writing. He, he may have excluded other hobbies. I mean, he was also not a fan of sports. He... Uh, said early on that give me anything to do but just nothing to do with sports and I can't agree more with that I'm not really a fan of sports um if anything I'm I'm more interested in more niche um, physical activities um, fencing parkour that sort of stuff not really conventional football or anything like that never really been uh, my cup of tea to be rather English which Hitchens was he was he was born in England as I'm sure you know and he moved over to the US because, quite frankly, that was where everything was at the time. And uh, it, it comes to me no surprise, in a sense, that 
his brother Peter Hitchens hasn't really done the same amount of um, impact. He hasn't impacted things as much as Hitchens. This isn't to say that it was all down to the geography of where they lived, however, because Peter definitely doesn't have the same rhetoric or charm. Oh God, he does not have the charm whatsoever, as his brother Christopher did. Uh, with that said, though, I can respect his attempts at being relevant um, during COVID, especially in the UK. He was on quite a lot of uh, radio stations. He's been interviewed. And it's not like I don't like his brother, but it's quite clear that people turned up, for example, to the debate that he had with Christopher on God, um, not because of Peter, but because of Hitchens. Uh, Christopher Hitchens, I mean. I'm so used to using that term. And even today, I, I, I watch his interviews and I only started watching his stuff because of his brother. And that is quite sad, maybe, that your attention is due to your sibling. But I don't want to diminish what Peter has done because I know that he's written some books and I know that he uh, writes articles. So his work isn't irrelevant by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Although he does believe addiction isn't a uh, mental illness or, or, or uh, whatever you want to call it. He doesn't believe in addiction, which is absurd. Um, but we won't go there. We won't go there. So his brother... Yes, not as charming, but still interesting. So I'd recommend anyone who's uh, interested in more conservative views to check him out if that's your if that's your thing. Throughout the book, I was also, as I usually do with Hitchens, I was researching the meaning of many words because I was wondering what the heck they meant. Because uh, well, Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens, was a literary connoisseur. He knew how to write, he knew how to use the English language as a weapon. Later on he talks about Nietzsche and how the claim, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. Hitchens said that he didn't quite agree with this. Whilst it is true that our suffering does harden us and it does often replenish and fuel us to go on to big things, to actualize ourselves, whatever you might draw from that word. I mean, look at Dostoevsky, for example. He was in a Siberian camp for a few years and he got out and wrote so many brilliant novels. Um, there's a clear correlation there. He clearly used his experiences and his existential angst and his lessons learned to uh, write those books. And the real question is, to what cost do we suffer to do these kind of great feats. Would Dostoevsky take back his time in prison? I think not. And the question is, yeah, like how much suffering do we need to endure in order to, to just to borrow a Maslow term, to self-actualize, to transcend above a point where we understand ourselves enough to live intrinsic to our being? Not to be too, um, abstract about things, but I hope hopefully you see where I'm coming from. There comes a point where we suffer and learn and we become our fully fledged person or more of a person. Um, it reminds me of Carl Rogers' humanistic therapy, right? Um, his book On Becoming a Person, he describes how people become a person from their suffering, from their pain. And Hitchens' point is that, yes, whilst to an extent suffering makes us stronger, it can also cripple us to an, to an extent where we literally break down and decay and maybe even die. And I think there is an element of truth to both suppositions, because on one hand, as I've said, suffering can help you self-actualise to a higher place of being, let's say. On the other, it can destroy you, completely and utterly destroy you to to the level of death, um, beyond death, which is destruction, outwardly destruction anyway. So I, I quite enjoyed Hitchens' point about this and him using his cancer to put this case in point. Hitchens also discussed immortality fairly briefly, but he did raise an interesting point, which is if we were all immortal, we would never 
supersede our parents, we would never supersede our siblings, we wouldn't in a sense grow because we need that finality, we need that pressure that death gives, that mortality gives. We need a sense of urgency in our life, otherwise well, why would we do, why would we do anything at all? Why would we get out of bed in the morning? And if we can obviously do whatever we want to do in the next hundred years, in the next thousand years. And Hitchens makes this point. And what he also said was, which was quite saddening actually, he wrote how he was watching his old uh, videos on YouTube and uh, very brief, only a sentence, but he just said how it's a misery seeing himself in those old videos because he's, well, obviously comparing his previous abilities, rhetorical abilities, physical abilities, mental abilities, to what he is now, which is in a hospital bed, transfusions, operations. So, as I said at the beginning of this video, it's a very sad book, especially if you like Hitchens as much as me. But when Hitchens talked about sad things, he would often find a way to make it amusing. For example, he was asked by a rabbi um, on what he would say to a dying friend, and Hitchens replied, I'm actually not the one who is particularly asked to be... Um... <laughs> There for the obsequies. Uh, I got gotcha. you. They tend to say, uh, you remember that nice dinner we had about five years ago? Where, uh, we were all on corking form, yeah. Um, but the, I'm sure that the, my, the fact that I'm not asked to be at the bedside is nothing to do with the fact that I, I have no false consolation to offer. And that I don't think there's anything to be afraid about. You're not going to know you're dead. There's nothing to be afraid about. The only thing that you could think of that would be really terrifying is if you were told you're going to go on living forever. Now, there's a really unbearable thought. <laughs> a really disgusting one, and I can't offer that either. The saddest part of this book is the very end, when Carol Blue, his wife, says that Hitchens couldn't finish this book, so she had to. And she wrote a small acknowledgement of her and his life, how she feels, what happened. Um, he didn't actually die directly of cancer, he got pneumonia, which is a byproduct that you can have because of your weak immune system. So pneumonia took him out at the end um, after a few, because he had it a few times, but then he obviously had it for the last time. So it's a, it's a very, very, very heartbreaking end of the piece, but what Carol Blue says is that whilst she had the last word of this book, Hitchens always had the last word otherwise, because there were small pieces of paper with his notes in all of his books at his house. She would walk past his towers of books um, and she would find new slips of paper that she hadn't read. She would call this the unpublished Hitch. And yeah, she was just being more personal. A woman's touch is always good in a book like this. Speaking of the towels of books, another reference to Hitchens is actually this bookshelf. This style of bookshelf is called an invisible bookshelf. And it's called invisible because it has the illusion from a bit of a distance. Normally the slabs are a bit thinner because this is a, uh, this is a homemade one that my dad built me. As I've said, it has the illusion of being a stack of books on top of one another, but in actual fact, it is supported. Because otherwise, they would just fall over if, <laughs> if a small rumble or whatever you want to call it occurs. I wanted to read some quotes, though, my, my favourite quotes from the book to end the video. So, here we go. To the dumb question, why me? The cosmos barely bothers to return the reply, why not? Myself, I love the imagery of struggle. I sometimes wish I was suffering in a good cause or risking my life for the good of others, instead of just being a gravely endangered patient. 
Allow me to inform you, though, that when you sit in a room with a set of other finalists, and kindly people bring a huge transparent bag of poison and plug it into your arm, and you either read or don't read a book while the venom sac gradually empties itself into your system, the image of the ardent soldier or revolutionary is the very last one that will occur to you. You will feel swamped with passivity and impotence, dissolving in powerlessness like a sugar lump in the water. When I described the tumour in my esophagus as a blind, emotionless alien, I suppose that even I can help award it some of the qualities of a living thing. This at least I know to be a mistake. An instance of the pathetic fallacy, angry cloud, proud mountain, presumptuous little bandidus, by which we ascribe animate qualities to inanimate phenomena. To exist, a cancer needs a living organism, but it cannot ever become a living organism. Its whole malice, there I go again, lies in the fact that the best it can do is to die with its host. Either that, or its host will find the measures with which to extirpate and outlive it. What if I pulled through and the pious faction contendingly claimed that their prayers had been answered? That would somehow be irritating. For me, to remember friendship is to recall those conversations that it seemed a sin to break off. The ones that made the sacrifice of the following day a trivial one. It's probably a merciful thing that pain is impossible to describe from memory. Brave? Ha! Save it for a fight you can't run away from. Okay, so that is all of the quotes I wanted to share to you guys. It is actually quite dark outside. I'm filming this a lot later than I usually would. I, I quite like to get natural light into my videos when I film. But today I felt, not only is it a very dark and gloomy day, I also felt that perhaps we must attribute pathetic fallacy to this situation because it's obviously a dark day in a metaphorical sense. And it was a dark day at the time. But what we must remember when we do think of people in the memorial sense is that they existed in the first place and that we had the honour to read, in this instance, Hitchens, and we still do, thank God for that. Again, pardon the pun. That is something we have to remember, that he did exist in the first place and... I was lucky enough to live at the same time as him, although I didn't actually know of him whilst he was alive, which is regretful. But I will take what I can in the positive and constructive sense and let the hitch live on, I say. And I'm sure to the viewers of this video, you are doing so as well by simply reading his books, quoting him, wearing dumb t-shirts like this, um, wearing coats that are very similar to a photo shoot that he did many years ago, and using his same style of bookshelf, drinking Johnny Walker Black at probably your own expense. <laughs> the book that I forgot to mention, one of the main ones that I enjoyed was Letters to a Young Contrarian, and Hitchens wrote this in 2001, I believe, this is a really, really good book if you haven't read this already. Now, it is heavily political, however, there are so many great passages. Some of his best work is in that book. It's a very short book, and essentially it's how to be a critical thinker. It has so many, so many great quotes um, that you can use upon the disbeliever if you come into an argument, um, or even on yourself if you run out of self-esteem, because Hitchens had a way of motivation. He rejected the claim of contrarian, but I'm afraid the label of contrarian is something that you're given instead of um, give yourself. And I think that we can all agree that to us at least, Christopher Hitchens was a contrarian. He was a dissident. He was somebody that we should remember and embody his spirit in what we do and how we do it. Thank you so much for watching. I've been ahead of the curve and uh, do check out my other videos if you are interested. And I've also linked 
in the description, other videos referencing Hitchens, other book reviews maybe, or discussions where Hitchens is prevalent. So do check those out. I'll see you soon. Have a good day wherever you might be. And remember, don't be afraid to use the hitch slap. See ya.